Namaste. Welcome to Kaivalya Yoga Gurukulam or KYG to the KYG Shrine. We are doing a series called the KYG Shrine series. If this is the first video you are watching, then I urge you to go back to the playlist on our channel on YouTube at KYG Yoga and watch it from the beginning so you'll have a connection as to how um, I'm offering an explanation as to the setup of KYG Shrine, why it is in a particular way, how is the Kaivalya Lingam designed and so on. In this episode, we're going to talk about this principle, the Adi Shakti principle. Why is this idol placed in front of the Shiva Lingam? And so on. And what is, what is the intricate details of this idol? How is she manifested um, for us at KYG in this manner? The whole of spiritual progress follows what is called Mano Dharma. Mano Dharma is the Dharma of one's heart. Though Mano means mind, it's not technically mind. It's, the, it's about one's feeling, one's emotions, one's bhava. So follow according to your bhava and, and um, the inner intuitive guidance. For over many decades, this particular vision has always presented itself to me when I think of a temple. When I think of the alignment of energies inside the body, this is the, this is the shakti or the energy that has always manifested. So allow me to offer my explanation as the way the KYG shrine which was inside me has now manifested it for all our benefit for all of uh, humanity if you will. Because there is no right and wrong in the way we set up, set up a shrine. Yes, there are traditions that are followed uh, as to the Agama Shastras, there are traditions that are followed in temples, there are traditions that are followed in South India versus North India and there are so many traditions and practices that have evolved because our civilization and when I say our civilization, I'm talking of the Indian subcontinent civilization, especially in the spiritual field. It, is, it has been there for over thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years. And therefore, it is natural for different teachers, different schools of thought to have slowly evolved. But the essence is always the same. The essence is the divine principle within oneself. That has never changed, right? The approaches, the methods, the techniques have changed. And therefore, it is in that light I'm offering this to you all for your own consideration and see if it appeals to you and makes sense to you. Shakti and Shiva. Shiva is total auspiciousness. That is the auspiciousness of the oneness of the three forces, the creative force Brahma, the active force Vishnu and the fulfillment force Shiva. So you have Sattva, Rajas and Tamas all together. When we see that as a universal force, we see that as a force unified within us then that becomes Shiva. And the Shakti that emerges from Shiva, she, the, Shakti and Shiva are never different. Shakti that emerges from Shiva is what we see here. And that's why we call it the Adi Shakti, the primordial Shakti, the primordial energy. This is within us too. When we are fast asleep, fast asleep, okay, as an example, can I hear when I'm fast asleep? No. Can I see when I'm fast asleep? No. Can I smell? Can I taste? Nothing. I am fast asleep. Even I don't exist. I do, but I don't know that I exist. Correct? You don't know you exist when you're fast asleep. That is an idea to give you as to what is the state of Shiva. He's not fast asleep. He's exactly the opposite in the other side of the spectrum. Lost in the self. So, when I say he, please take it in context. So, because that's a, that's a tattva, that's a concept, right? It, there's no he or she to it, but I'm just using that as a he and this as a she for us to understand. So, he is lost in himself, self-illumined, completely lost in himself. So lost like you and I are in deep sleep that even he doesn't know he, he exists. So, then what happens? So, that is sat. Then comes consciousness. When you wake up, when I wake up from that deep sleep, then... My Shakti wakes up along with me. My, in fact, my Shakti is what wakes me up. What is that? Chetana Shakti, Chit, Consciousness. So, Truth and Consciousness can never be separate. When Consciousness comes in, then the Truth becomes aware of itself. So, Shakti makes Shiva aware of himself. This happens within us too. When I am awake, 
when I wake up, then I begin to understand who I am. I am able to hear. Hearing is my Shakti. I am able to see. Seeing is my Shakti. I am able to speak, such as now. Speaking is my Shakti. I am able to touch. Touching is my Shakti and so on. So everything that I do other than deep sleep is an expression of the Shakti within me. Now, is my hearing separate from me? Is my seeing separate from me? They cannot be separated, correct? That is why Shakti and Shiva are actually studied separately, but they are never separate. They can never be separated. This creation and the creator can never be separated. There is no creator sitting separate from creation, looking down upon creation. That was never the concept taught in the Vedanta. That, was ne that is never the concept taught in Sanatana Dharma. This entire creation is an expression of that divine consciousness in the form of Adi Shakti. So all that we see here is the Maha Maya in action. That is the idea. So Adi Shakti emerges from the Lingam. That is why she's, she will be in KYG always in front. Even if tomorrow, uh, God willing, we have separate temples, this temple will be a big one at the back and there will be a smaller shrine, a smaller temple in front of that temple. And thus it will be aligned, the forces align themselves just like they align themselves in the spinal cord. Shakti at the base, she arises to meet Shiva at the top. Alright, let's come to this particular idol now that I have set up the base of understanding what is Shakti and Shiva. So this particular arch, when I met the sculptor, I explained to him what I had in mind and I had so much more to add to this particular idol that he said for the size that you are looking for, um, it is not possible. However, he said, I have a similar drawing which I can share with you. And I said, okay, for now, when I saw the drawing, I said, for now, maybe this is what the divine wants me to manifest. And therefore, I said, all right, I'll do that. Because if I add too many details in this particular size, then there will be a compromise in the quality. Because I wanted to add all aspects of creation in that. So when we look at her, when we look at the idol, we are reminded that this is what we are looking at. But nevertheless, I think um, most of what I wanted has, has been achieved in this idol. So let me explain to you, starting with this arch behind the Devi. In the outer edge of this arch are the zodiac signs, the 12 zodiac signs. For here, there is Libra, then there is Scorpio, then there is um, Dhanus, um, and then there is Capricorn and so on. So you have all of them here. Similarly, you start from A uh, Aries and Taurus and Gemini and so on. So they are all here. In the inner circle, the inner part of that, you have the 27 star constellation. A very advanced study of Vedic astrology, very, which is very predominant in the south. When I say Vedic astrology, please don't understand this as what is being modern, practiced in the modern sense, like you are seeing YouTube channels. They are all uh, very gross misrepresentations as to what was the original intent of Vedic astrology it was very, very, very different from how we are applying it today. So we won't even go there now. At some other point, we will study that in detail. Nevertheless, in that Vedic astrology, in the science of Vedic astrology, the star constellation played a very important role. And 27 such star constellations were identified and therefore each of the star or nakshatra as we call it is represented here. In the center is Chitra, right in the center. And then you have uh, Swati and Vishaka and so on this side. And then you have the others coming here, Hasta, Chitra and so on. When the moon passes through these star constellations in conjunction with the zodiac signs in the cosmos, then the energy, the biomagnetic energy that is radiated from that affects very in a very subtle but in a very powerful way our unconscious and subconscious mind. And that's therefore our thoughts, our words and actions are influenced by that confluence of moon, the star constellation and the zodiac sign in which is placed. And at that same time, where the planets, the other planets are placed, there is a lot going on in the cosmos. And the cosmos is never a static place. So then our lives therefore go through a lot of changes. It doesn't mean we are victims of circumstances. It just means that at this point, because of the lack of awareness of our integration with the universe around us, we feel we are victims, but actually we are not. 
we are the ones who orchestrate events in our lives and like i said when we study vedic astrology uh, i want to definitely share the essence of that at least with you all because that is a very empowering self empowering science all of these energies serve us work through us in conjunction with our spiritual energy and therefore they are very powerful so that is represented here when i look at this arch i'm reminded of my connection with the universe so my mind expands and provides space for growth internally spiritual growth devi herself this is a feminine energy simply because um there is creation there are hills and dales and rivers and 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 birth and death and all the five senses come alive all of this is experienced there is so, so much beauty around um beauty is is usually associated with feminine energy for for your understanding and my understanding and therefore shakti is always given a feminine place um, in our civilization it's not a fixed rule but it just becomes so natural at least for me now i i don't fight that i just accept it and i it's very natural for me to follow that so therefore i will say this is a she and that's a he so she she has the moon on the crown the eighth night of the moon ashtami chandra vibhraj dalika stala shobita she adorns the moon on a crown and this adornment this is the eighth night of the moon the eighth night of the moon whether it's waxing or waning is always the same when you look up at the moon you will not be able to distinguish is this the waning phase or the waxing phase so the direction the size and everything is exactly the same this is very important because that is where the mind it signifies the mind in a state of equanimity neither waxing nor waning and therefore she wears that so ashtami is actually a very beautiful night a very powerful night for for spiritual practices and meditations we discussed a lot of the, about this in the devi khadgamala so i urge you to watch that playlist as well that's an, a a very deep study into the sri chakra and the devi khadgamala in her two hands at the back she holds two items here one represents the lasso this one here represents the lasso a lasso which you use for pulling a car for a cow and keeping it under control a lasso is for pulling on this side there is what is called a goad a goad is what an elephant uh, mahut uses he ne prods the elephant to go forward and directs the elephant with this a, a powerful energy an animal like an elephant this little guy sits on top and he's controlling the elephant uh, how because he has this this pointed little spear in his hand in which he directs what is the significance and why is this primordial principle holding it this energy this powerful energy of the universe is constantly pulling us and pushing us pulling us with the lasso pushing us with the the ankusha so i'll use the word pasha and ankusha from now so she we she uses pasha to pull us back she uses the ankusha to push us forward what is she pulling us back from this represents craving raga raga is craving we are talking of two extremes and all of our lives experiences go between these two extremes one is raga craving and the other one is aversion hatred dislike dvesha raga dvesha raga dvesha so on the one side you are extremely craving for something on the other side we are averse we are uh, uh, we experience aversions hatred dislike and so on our entire spectrum of lives and and all our dealings and actions and everything is in the spectrum of like versus dislike craving and aversion so when we crave something and it goes towards our craving when our craving begins to increase then the energy puts a lasso and pulls us back and then when we are averse to something when we say no no this is bad or this is not what i want this is not spirituality this that whatever then she pushes us there so she teaches us because of the ashtami chandra has to remain equanimity this this practice of equanimity is represented by the moon immediately you see that that equanimity is attained when there is a push and pull who controls it this primordial energy controls it so when i awaken this adi shakti within me i learn and i learn to harness my creativity within the forces of push and pull within pasha and ankusha so there is no good and evil here it is just craving and dislike whatever it is that i am craving okay 
what, whether it is food or whether it is an experience or whether it is anything, whatever it is that I am craving for, craving itself tilts the balance. Same way dislike, hatred, aversion, that also tilts the balance, irrespective of good and bad and all of that. This is simply those two energies, we learn to balance that. In the front, what does she hold in her front hand? In this is a sugar cane, she holds a sugar cane, this is the stem of a sugar cane and it sprouts very beautifully. Sugar cane represents sweetness, the sweet experience of life, right? And what are these? There are five of these that sprout out and they are our five senses. The fundamental senses of the universe, if you will, the sense of sound, Shabdha, Sparsha, the sense of touch, Rupa, the sense of sight, Rasa, the sense of taste and Gandha, the sense of smell. So, Shabda, Sparsha, Rupa, Rasa and Gandha, all of these are experienced by the mind. She holds that in her hand, on her right front hand, which is the first hand that you see, right hand, right? Right hand is always what we use now generally. She holds a parrot. This parrot represents you and me as the soul's journey, the jiva principle. She holds the jiva in her hand. The bird signifies enlightenment. The bird signifies the soul's journey towards Godhead, towards understanding its true nature. This is in her hand and therefore she guides us by holding it. And therefore it brings a sense of humility that once I understand this power, this power will guide me towards my destination. I don't have to, as Sundara here, make some conscious efforts. I just keep practicing and then when she awakens within me, she begins to guide me towards my uh, destination. She uh, brings the right book to me, she brings the right teacher to me, she brings the right video for me to watch and so on and so forth. Whatever it is, every single experience in my life is then designed by this awakened energy. And I intuitively begin to move towards my divine origin, which results ultimately in the highest form of self-empowerment and self-actualization. Then we come to what is, we see here the, the bosom of Devi, large bosoms. The mammals, all of us, when we are born, we go towards our mother for initial sustenance. Without that primordial sustenance from the mother's bosom, we will not survive at all, right? So in this cosmic scheme of things, with her large bosoms, she is constantly providing us sustenance because in this cosmic presence, when I look and think of the cosmos, who am I? I'm just a newborn baby. I have no idea what to do, where to go, right? So as a newborn baby, I look to her for sustenance. I look to her for knowledge. I look to her for providing me strength. I look to her for grace. I look to this cosmic energy. Give me grace. Give me support. Provide me. Guide me. Help me, right? That comes from the bosom of the mother. So the bosom is, is a signif it signifies motherhood, divinity that provides constant nutrition to us. So when I look at a bosom and I meditate, I think of this amazing endless capacity to give. That is the beauty of this cosmic energy. And then she sits in Padmasana. She's sitting in Padmasana or Siddhasana as it is actually displayed here because the sculptor explains that Padmasana will be a little difficult and I wanted to make sure Siddhasana and Padmasana are two asanas that are considered the king and queen of all asanas because they signify stillness. Siddhasana is that which signifies a complete um, a pose that brings about fruition, Siddha. So she sits in Siddhasana. It's also un popularly understood as Padmasana because the, the, the foot comes up and the foot of the Devi is considered to be like a lotus and therefore it is like a lotus. So Siddhasana or Padmasana both signify stillness, completely rooted in that creation. Creation is here for stay. It is not an historical event as science is understanding, but it is simply a manifestation in our consciousness. It will always be as long as you are conscious in some form or the other. We can call it beginning of creation, ending of creation. We, call, we can call it cycles of yugas and cycles of time. We, we are looking at it from only one angle, time. But then the cosmic scheme of things in the consciousness of Shiva, this is eternal. 
the cycles of yuga and all of that, creation doesn't come to an end. Creation undergoes cycles, but that doesn't mean it comes to an end. You and I change clothes every day. It doesn't mean we come to an end and we are born again. We just change clothes. We are the same. And therefore, creation is here to stay. This signifies that creation is here. It's not going anywhere. And therefore, that pose. To me, at this moment, in the KYG Shrine, this is a manifestation of sheer grace that she has manifested through the sculptor's hand in such a beautiful manner. And when we do the prana pratishta and actually infuse life and energy into this through a ritual at some time in the future, um, then she will become more alive. And then everything that we do to this, we will actually be doing as a symbolically as worshipping and revering the universe around us, the environment around us. My dear brothers and sisters, she represents the earth element, Prakriti. You and I fight over a boundary line that goes five inches this way or five inches that way. We fight for nations. Uh, we divide this beautiful earth into so many pieces where the mind has not been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, says Rabindranath Tagore in his poem, in his prayer. Prakriti, when we look at her, there has to be no fragments. There has to be no division because all of this belongs to her. And all of this that you see here is a manifestation of her. So we respect the trees that grow around us. We respect the earth around us that we walk on. We respect the air we breathe. We invoke and respect the energy of the sun that nourishes us. Everything is emanating from this divine consciousness that we understand as creation. This is Adi Shakti who has come from Lingodbhava and she sits as a royal queen in the KYG shrine. Lingodbhava Shri Maharagni Aim Hreem Shreem Devi. As always, thank you so much for watching. Stay blessed, stay inspired. Namaste. Om Namah Shivaya.